Let's consider Renaissance left hand daggers. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Guided Tour, and the dagger that I'm holding here is one of the new weapons coming in the new batch, the second batch, in the certified Royal Armouries line, which I work on with Windlass and the Royal Armouries. And this is modelled very, very closely on an actual example in the Royal Armouries. Now, there are a couple of things I wanted to say about left-hand daggers, um, because I think there's a few misconceptions, but also I think there's a few things that are overlooked about them. So the first thing that we're going to look at is what is a left hand dagger? Well, as it sounds like on the tin, it's something that you hold in your left hand, very often used with a rapier. And that is how most people are familiar with them, is they think of these as a set with a sword in one hand and a dagger in the other. One thing we have to make clear though, is they're often in people's imaginations, I think, and often in movies paired with a rapier. But in fact, they can be paired with any sword. And if we look at the period fencing treatises, whether it's with a side sword, that's an earlier cut and thrust sword that was around at the same time as rapiers, but also earlier, or indeed with basket hilted swords, which there's one of in the new batch coming up from the Royal Armourers as well. So if we look at things like George Silver, for example, using uh, forms of what he referred to as short sword or back sword, as opposed to a rapier, they were used in the left hand in the off hand. Now, why did they come in? Well, formerly, the most popular thing to use in the left hand, if you used anything in the left hand, was a buckler. But it's very much the case that it seems that in around 1570, 1580, through to 1590, bucklers start to have become pretty much unfashionable, and daggers came in. And this relates to one of the other points that we're going to mention here, but I'll come back to that in a second. So, Daggers came in, why? Well, I've made some arguments in the past about the fact that it's that they're particularly well suited to dealing with rapiers. And I do actually still agree with that. I haven't changed my mind. However, I have to caveat that with a point. First of all, why are they well uh, suited to dealing with rapiers? Well, because they've got a blade and they've got cross guards. Now, bucklers are great against cutting swords. Really, really good and good general purpose thing to have in your left hand against other types of weapons like spears and halberds and all sorts of things when coupled with a sword. But one of the great things about the dagger is it's very good at engaging thrusting weapons and locking them up, binding them, steering the point away, which bucklers really aren't great at doing. Bucklers are great at taking cuts. They're not great at dealing with thrusts. There are certain types of bucklers, the so-called um, targa, which is corrugated. The certain types of bucklers which have raised ribs. Maybe we'll look at those in more detail in a future video for catching points. But unless you modify the basic buckler, as we see being done in the 16th and 17th centuries, a dagger is sometimes a more straightforward solution to dealing with thrusting weapons like rapier. Now, what's that caveat I was talking about? Well, so the caveat is that actually the dagger starts to be popular as an offhand weapon before the rapier is really invented. So I don't think we can argue that the impetus for these being used as offhand weapons, left-hand weapons, was the rapier. Because as I say, in the time of Marozzo, 1536, we already have a section on sword and uh, dagger. Now there is of course also a section on sword and buckler. In fact, sword and buckler is the majority of the Bolognese sources that we look at, Marozzo Manciolino being the earliest two that we have except for maybe Anonimo, which we're not sure about the dating of. But sword and dagger was already starting to be a thing in the 1530s. Now, in the 1530s, the rapier, as we think of it, that is the very specialised, long, nimble thrusting sword, thin thrusting sword, which has lost a lot of the cutting capacity in order to maximise the length and uh, reach for thrusting, hasn't really come around yet. So well, what you commonly think of as a rapier doesn't really come around until the middle of the 1500s, 1550, 60, 70. So we're really dealing with what in the modern world we refer to as side swords, cut and thrust swords, which aren't really very different to earlier arming swords of the 15th century. They just start to have more complex hand guards on them. So the question is, why did the dagger start to become more popular than the buckler? Well, we don't fully know the answer to that question. But one possible factor behind here is these are, what we're predominantly talking about here, are civilian swords. Now, that's not to say they weren't carried in war. They were carried in war, okay? But it's very clear that the casual carrying and wearing of swords in civilian life and the rise of dueling culture really was a thing of the 16th century. It wasn't very common in the 15th century at all. 
and in fact many places legally prohibited the wearing of swords openly in the 15th century. But in the 16th century everyone seems to have turned a blind eye to it and everyone started wearing swords around. Now, if you're the fashionable man about town wearing your side sword or your rapier or your basket hilt, it seems that bucklers probably weren't particularly fashionable or popular to wear after a certain date, after let's say about 1570-1580. In England the buckler stayed in use quite late, but in most continental Europe it seems that the buckler faded away in the middle of the 1500s, in the middle of the 16th century, and was replaced by the dagger. So, for probably for fashion reasons, and partially for utilitarian reasons. Now, you also have to think about the practicalities here. There were some places where you couldn't wear your sword into. You might, if you're going to an inn, if you're going for a night out, you're going for dinner, you might not wear a sword. Um, you might wear a sword, depending on the, you might, if you're walking around the streets, but there are certainly some circumstances where you might not wear a sword, and these aren't all legal. These aren't all even societal norms. Sometimes they're to do with practical reasons as well. Um, you know, wearing a sword can be pretty inconvenient, but if you can wear a dagger, then that's clearly a very good thing. So, if you're going around with a dagger, uh, a sword and a dagger, and you decide to get rid of the um, sword, then you still have a dagger on. And there is a parallel to be made here with the Japanese custom of wearing the daisho, the katana and the wakisashi, because of course there were situations where you didn't or chose not to wear your katana into certain places, but you would still wear your wakasashi, so you still have a weapon. Now one of the beauties of having the sword and dagger, or rapier and dagger, is that if you get rid of the sword or rapier, you've still got a weapon, you've still got the dagger, which of course, if you have a buckler <laughs> and you get rid of the sword for some reason, you're just left with a buckler. Now a buckler might be okay for punching people with or defending yourself in a pinch by itself, but fundamentally it's not a weapon, okay? If someone's got a knife and you've just got a buckler, yes, you can protect yourself to an element, but they're gonna have an advantage because they've got a dagger. So I think that's part of it. I think fashion's part of it. Um, I think potentially the types of sword as we go into the rapier era, I do think there are mechanical advantages to having a dagger over a buckler, for example. Uh, but there's one final thing I want to address about types of left-hand dagger. Incidentally, sometimes known as mangoche, which is a term you'll notice I don't use very often because it's just French for left hand. And I don't like the use of um, non-English words in the English language that don't actually add anything. If I refer to a mangoche, you might know I mean a left hand dagger, but why not just say left hand dagger? Mangoche just means left hand. Anyway, um, I think that uh, there's a few factors that we need to look at to do with these, which I think get overlooked. So the first of those is this massive example that I'm holding um, that weighs about 800 grams, if I remember correctly, from the Royal Armouries, is very, very much adapted to combat against swords and fighting. Why do I say that? Well, it's got this massive, great uh, ring with closed port, with closed plate inside, perforated but closed nevertheless, which provides a lot of good protection to the back of the hand when you're holding it. The way you hold these, incidentally, is usually with the thumb up, either on the back of the grip or on the blade. Sometimes there's even a place to put uh, up there for the thumb. Um, and uh, you'll notice also that the guard curls outwards. Now, this is very clearly for parrying. Okay, we'll come back to this in a bit more detail in a second. But therefore, this is a dagger which is very, very much adapted for defense against swords, primarily probably, but also other weapons as well. As I say, I'll come back to that. However, here's the thing which often gets overlooked when talking about left-hand daggers. If we actually go into museum collections, the Royal Armouries, the Wallace Collection, the Victorian Albert Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Stibbet Collection, the Musée de l'Armée, wherever, okay? When we go into those and we look specifically at left-hand daggers, in fact, the vast majority of left-hand daggers are not massive ones like this that are really well adapted to defense. They are actually just small daggers, okay? Now, this one has a side ring. That became quite conventional in the 16th century. This is a Hanway one, incidentally. This is actually Lucy's, not mine. Um, uh, but most of them that you see in collections don't even necessarily have this much. Some of them have really short little guards just with little ball ends. And if they do have a side ring, it's often very small. And some of them don't even have a side ring. And yet they're still referred to by curators and in collections and in the auction antique world 
as mangosh or left hand daggers and many of them were used as left hand daggers in fact if we look at treatises we see little daggers being used in the left hand to parry swords with but fundamentally they are just a small dagger that you wear at your belt and you use when you really really need to or get into a duel so these are the sorts of daggers that are easy to wear you kind of forget that they're there because they're not big enough to really provide any kind of inconvenience they don't get in the way the cross guards short so that doesn't get caught on stuff they don't have big side rings or shell guards as is popular in hema because you have to bear in mind if you know you're going to fight then indeed you might wear something like this. You might wear something with a long blade, a big blade, a blade catching, uh, you know, with teeth on it, with big cross guard for catching an opponent's blade, with a big uh, ring or a big shell guard for protecting your hand, if you know you're going to be fighting. So in a HEMA context, in a fencing context, it makes sense because you're only carrying that, you're not wearing the dagger to training for, for dress purposes, at least not usually. Um, you're usually wearing it because you know you're gonna fence. But actually in Renaissance Europe, if you're talking about 1580, 1600, 1620, in France, Italy, Spain, England, Germany, wherever, most of the time, like 99% of the time when you're wearing a dagger around, it's not because you're going out looking for a fight, at least you shouldn't be, uh, it's just because you're wearing it because that's part of what you wear. So a lot of these left-hand daggers are actually pretty small. And what we use in HEMA, and some of the big, the ones we really love to replicate like these, are not typical. So that's the message I want to, you to go away with here, is that these massive fighty ones are not typical actually small daggers that you can easily wear at your side are more typical but they were nevertheless still used with rapiers in fencing and of course that would change a lot of things for those of you who fence rapier and dagger if you get a small simulator with a shorter blade maybe only a nine nine inch ten inch blade instead of your big 12 or 18 inch blade um, and you have a shorter guard you don't have a big shell it changes how you use the dagger um, a lot of people get very complacent because they've got a big long blade, they've got great big uh, cross guard and shell guard or rings and uh, the, you know they stick the dagger out there and they can parry rapiers all day, it's brilliant for the job. But imagine wearing that all the time and remember that historically speaking most people didn't wear left hand daggers of that kind of size or with that much hand protection. So be wary of that. Right, one final thing I wanted to say as well is this is also sort of a misconception about these left hand daggers is that I think that people always think of them as paired with a sword and as I've said I think most people think of them as paired with a rapier but they can be paired with any type of sword in this period but here's the thing they were often used by themselves and in fact the Alatrist books actually represent this fairly well the so-called left hand dagger doesn't have to be a left hand dagger it can also be a right hand dagger and this can be used in numerous ways and this is shown in in the manuals in the treatises as well if we look at Morozzo we can see the dagger being used like a dagger in techniques which are very reminiscent of Fiore de Liberi's treaties from 1400 so more than 100 years earlier and this was just a dagger so the fact that it's a left hand dagger and some of them were adapted to be really quite good at parrying and, and dealing with other weapons they could also just be used by themselves as a knife as a dagger and obviously like examples like this are able to chop as well as to stab obviously the lighter smaller versions are more just stabbing implements but therefore because these were often used by themselves don't only think about these adaptations as being for left hand defense against with used with a sword against someone else with a sword and dagger this is also just a general extra defensive capacity to the dagger so if this is the only weapon you're carrying either because of legal or societal or fashion reasons and you don't have your sword on and someone attacks you with a sword if you have one of these, the fact that you've got this extra protection and a big blade and you know these hooked quillons and things like this is very useful in just defending yourself just with this and moreover it's also better against other knives. If your opponent attacks you with one of these, if you've got one of these you've got way more hand protection and it is much easier to defend yourself against incoming knife attacks if you've got that le level of cross guard and shell or ring or whatever you've got on there moreover and i think this is another thing that people often don't think about this is also pretty good at defending i think against things even more potent than swords 
such as spears, partisans, halberds, bills, things like this. So if you were in a situation where this was literally the only thing you were wearing because that was your dressing, you're not wearing a sword, you're not expecting trouble, and some crazy guardsman decides to come at you with a partisan, you are now not badly armed with one of these because you've got a weapon which has the ability to cut and thrust. It's, I mean, almost gladius size, but with way more hand protection and ability to lock up an opponent's polearm and catch things. Even if someone swings a, a halberd at your head, yes, you're gonna be wanting to move offline and probably deflect, but the fact that you've got these big guards, this big ring, and that level of hand protection, and that amount of mass, almost sword-like, well, it is sword-like mass in a small object, means it's much more potent in defense, even just by itself. Anyway, I hope that's given you some new information about so-called left-hand daggers, which really should have a better name, but I don't know what that name would be. Answers on a postcard or in the comments down below. And uh, yeah, I hope it's given you some new ideas about the left-hand dagger and made you hopefully see it in a slightly different light and think about it in a wider context than just used with a rapier in the left hand. Thanks a lot for watching. I have been Matt Easton. I will continue to be, and I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.